Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the UBC Learning Circle. I'm pleased to be joined in circle today by Drs. Nell Wyman and Terry Aldred. Uh, today, we're all going to be discussing the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we know that this is a topic on many people's minds right now, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get to it as soon as we can. So before I get into anything else, I would like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the traditional, ancestral, unceded and occupied territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have the conversations we do. So gentle reminder here, the, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Um, in particular, oh, sorry, in particular, we recognize that the ongoing pandemic is an emotionally salient topic for many of us. So please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, please don't hesitate to do so. So last little bit out of me here is uh, introductions. My name is Cole. I'm from the Chowethel First Nation. Uh, I'll be facilitating the session today, um, sharing our digital space, uh, but off camera are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Winona, our program assistant. If you feel so inclined, please introduce yourself in the chat box and, uh, and we'll get started. So with that, I'd like to, to pass the mic on over to, to our, our guests. Thank you, Cole and Ani Buju to everyone that's signed in so far. Hopefully more will join us. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction of myself. So my name is Nell Wyman. I'm originally from Little Grand Rapids First Nation, uh, which is a remote flying community in Northeastern Manitoba. Uh, I spent most of my life living in Ontario. Um, I, I'm trained as a psychiatrist and practiced clinically there for over 20 years, including eight years working on reserve in on the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. About three years ago, I moved to Vancouver um, to work for First Nations Health Authority and sort of made the switch into public health um, just in time for a global pandemic to happen. So it's been a very busy last year and very stressful and difficult for all of us. And I just want to actually um, take a moment just to acknowledge the people, the First Nations people that we have lost over the last year um, and uh, send my condolences and my sympathies for that. Um, I will begin, um, oh, sorry, I should mention uh, because I work at First Nations Health Authority, my current job title is Acting Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Um, and I'm also the president of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada. So enough about me. Um, I'd like to move forward to the land acknowledgement um, so, and center myself. So someone could advance the slide. Um, I don't know if it has. Has it? There we go. There we go. Okay, next, uh, next slide. So it's always important uh, for myself and others whenever we do presentations to uh, explicitly center ourselves and, and place ourselves where we are at. Um, so I'm Indigenous, not on my ancestral territory, and I respectfully acknowledge the land on which I work, live, and play is the traditional, ancestral, and continually occupied territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'd also just like to quickly thank the uh, Cole and the organizers of this learning circle that have brought me and Dr. Aldred here uh, to spend some time with you this morning. So that being said, I'll hand over to Dr. Terry uh, to give her introduction as well. Thank you. Um, actually, and we can uh, move the slide ahead. I had an introductory slide, but <laughs> I'm also happy to just uh, speak to it. So my name is Terry Aldred. I'm Dekas from Clasden, a member of Lasilu, the Frog Clan, uh, traditionally known as the Voice of the People. Um, on my mom's side and on my dad's side, I'm mixed European and Métis Cree. I'm a family doc by trade, um, and I've worked with Terry Sakani Family Services for the last seven years, doing both outreach um, and following up with virtual care to 12 First Nations in North Central BC. Um, and uh, recently joined FNHA as well as the medical director for primary care. And yeah, I 
do a few other things, um, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, this is a picture of me and my maternal grandmother. Um, I just like to bring my my family and my community with me on um, on my journeys as, as much as I can. Um, this picture is of Clay Lake Tene traditional territory where I have the honor to live, work and play. Um, just to the right of the picture is um, where Clay Lake gets its name, where the two rivers meet, so where the Nachaco meets the Fraser River um, in, in fall. Um, so beautiful traditional territories that we're calling in from. Um, if we could try uh, move the slide. Uh, so um, I guess just a rough overview. So I'm just going to talk a little bit initially about the vaccines um, in general um, and offer a, a little bit of background of where we are currently um, and then um, discuss a bit about some of the virtual services that um, have been stood up at FNHA to help support community members during this time. Um, and then discuss a little bit about my own vaccine story before I hand it back to Nell to um, discuss kind of the um, vaccine rollout approach um, and, and all her good work that she's doing in public health. Um, anything you want to add before I get started now? No? Okay. Um, okay, so right now we have um, two vaccines that are approved by Health Canada um, in Canada, and that's fi the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, both of these vaccines are what we call mRNA um, vaccines. And so um, these uh, vaccines, although um, novel, um, have been around like the type of vaccine mRNA mRNA have been around for actually about 20 years um, and have been used in, um, in uh, small scale outbreaks um, previously. Um, and so I know there's some, some misinformation around that, that, that they're completely new, but they have been, the technology have been used before. Um, and essentially what um, these, this type of uh, vaccine does is it helps to um, target both parts of our immune system. Um, so both our, our humoral and our cell immune systems. And I won't, uh, I won't quiz anybody on that, um, but essentially it helps to develop both um, an antibody response as well as um, cellular memory. Um, these uh, vaccines um, have been, so in the course of, um, the last year, um, these vaccines have been thoroughly tested and um, and have gone through the regular safety um, trials that all vaccines are needed, including um, ensuring that um, they uh, fall and and um, yeah that they address address all the requirements um, to be approved by Health Canada, um, and so in. Um, the reason why we were able to produce these vaccines so quickly is not because the safe, um, like the steps to assure safety were cut. It was because um, scientists, the academic community, governments, um, in, and um, companies, private companies, were all working together with the same goal um, to help kind of um, counteract um, the devastation um, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so a lot of the bureaucracy um, was cut down and people were sharing information and working together um, to, to produce these vaccines. Um, and in addition, um, many vaccines when they're first produced, when they um, go to their um, um, human trials, initially they, they don't actually have um, a large number of, um, of volunteers. So it could be um, in the hundreds to the low thousands. Um, but due to, um, again, the, the, um, the global effects of COVID and, um, and the, um, you know, the massive impact it's had, they actually had 30 to 40,000 people in each of the initial trials for Pfizer and Moderna. So um, actually a lot more people um, were part of the early clinical trials than normal. Um, and although we um, initially it was um, there were a lot of exclusion criteria in those studies, which is normal to do, um, over time they started having more people with various chronic diseases and um, at um, various stages of life um, be part of the clinical trial. And so um, there, there was a, uh, a good representation. Um, although these trials weren't done in Canada, um, in, they were done uh, mostly in the United States, um, they did um, have uh, some uh, First Nations 
communities, including the Navajo Nation that um, had volunteered to be part of the trial. Um, and so um, this background all to say is that these vaccines are, are safe um, and they're very highly effective um, for both of them, even after um, two weeks after your first um, injection, um, it's around 90% eff effective, give or take a couple percentage points. Um, and then after your second dose, um, it goes up to about 98% effective. Um, so they're, they're very effective um, um, against COVID. And um, although, um, you know, there is still some concerns around some of the long-term um, complications and, and for certain populations, like um, for those who are um, pregnant and breastfeeding, although I know those guidelines are changing rapidly um, um, as we get more and more data, um, the, um, those um, long-term risks at this point are, are purely theoretical um, and, and However, we know um, the effect of that COVID's having, including um, including people dying of COVID, but also people having long-term sequela of COVID. Um, and so, in BC, um, there's been three um, specialty clinics that have now been set up to help people um, that are having um, the the quote-unquote COVID long hauler or post-COVID post-COVID syndrome, um, where people are actually having um, you know, long-term symptoms like shortness of breath, um, fatigue, and including um, uh, depression and anxiety, um, you know, beyond six to eight weeks after their initial infection. And so, um, yeah, so the, the vaccine um, really helps, will help to count account, counteract the morbidity and mortality of, of getting COVID. <clears throat> And so um, I guess just to touch for, um, for the side effects of um, the COVID vaccine, a lot of it um, are very typical for, for many vaccines, um, including um, you can have a sore arm, um, kind of general muscle aches, um, uh, low grade fevers. Um, and um, the, the only um, absolute contraindication to getting the COVID vaccine is having an allergy to any of the components of the vaccine. Um, However, um, when you get the vaccine, um, they will go through, um, you know, any potential allergens and um, those sites will also have anaphylaxis kits um, in case there's a, an unknown allergy. Um, and the um, biggest thing or the most important thing is that um, once uh, vaccines do become available for you, it's still really important to um, adhere to the public health measures. Um, you know, um, as we get more data, we'll be able to know more about um, the effect. But at, at this time, we don't, um, we still don't know if people who have been vaccinated can transmit the virus. And so, um, although the va vaccine is, um, offers personal protection for you, um, it's really important that you still um, keep social distancing, um, you know, not, not gathering, um, wearing masks, um, using hand sanitizer, so that you're ensuring that you're still protecting those around you who may not be vaccinated. Um, you can move the slide, please. <laughs> um, so for um, COVID-19 among First Nations in BC, um, so um, this was um, updated uh, on January 16th, um, so uh, a bit, um, a bit out of date um, now, but um, shows the um, numbers in each of the um, health authorities. Um, so in Fraser, there's been 498 cases, um, in Interior, 394. Um, in the north where I'm located, um, unfortunately, we've had um, over 1,000 cases, um, 714 in Vancouver Coastal and 349 on Vancouver Island. Um, there's been over just over 3,000 cases confirmed across BC. Um, and um, at the time, there was about 953 active cases in BC. Um, and I think 3,229 um, um, being tested. Um, and so, um, yeah, so certainly I'm still seeing the effects of the second wave um, where. Um, you know, our, our case our, our case numbers um, were definitely increasing and in, um, particularly in the north, um, we, we had a, um, you know, a large increase in the second wave. Um, we actually did quite well, um, you know, uh, in, in the first wave and through the summer. Um, and so, yeah, definitely um, 
making a lot more real close to home. Um, anything um, you want to add now? No, I'm good so far. Thanks, Kit. Thanks, Terry. Okay, thanks. And um, we can move the slide. I keep on trying to move it myself. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, so the um, so the number of cases so we've um, in or near community so like on, on reserve was around 13, uh, 1,322 um, cases, um, and five hundred and fifty of those were considered active. And then off reserve there was um, one thousand six hundred and fifty five cases, um, three hundred and eighty four considered active. So um, slightly more in our um, urban and away from home populations. Uh, next slide. And so um, just to touch on some of the, the services um, that FNHAS stood up um, since the uh, pandemic started. On April 1st, the First Nations Virtual Doctor of the Day program um, began because um, due to many uh, communities closing, um, including not having people leave, but also not having um, people come in like um, physicians that do outreach like myself um, or nurses and that sort of thing. There was seems to be an urban need um, to ensure that um, people had access to physician services, including being able to, um, you know, get their prescriptions refilled um, and to talk about um, different things that were happening in case they did need to uh, leave on, on a more urgent basis and, and different things like that. Um, and so this um, service was stood up, um, yeah, and as I said, um, on April 1st, and it's open seven days a week uh, from 8.30 to 4.30. It's available through Zoom or phone. Um, Zoom, so that we have the ability to be able to do some assessment um, is preferred, um, but we can also do phone visits, um, knowing that some people have um, connectivity issues. Um, and so um, there's the number there, um, and it's manned. So there's um, four lines open every day um, based on which region you're calling in from. So on the island, north, interior, or uh, Fraser Coast Salish. Um, and our docs um, are screened and vetted um, to our, our those who um, have established either good relationships um, locally um, and have a culturally safe um, and humble practice. Um, and through that work, there was already seen to be a huge need and gap around mental health um, and addiction services. And so um, in August of uh, this, of 2020, um, we stood up the First Nations Virtual Substance Use and Psychiatry Pathway. Um, and so um, these, um, these pathways, so there's two, so we have um, one line for addictions and one line for mental health. And we have, um, 14 addiction docs and um, seven psychiatrists who um, have worked with our services. Um, the psychiatry is open from 10 to three, five days a week um, and substance uses from 9.30 to 5.30. Um, again, five days a week, Monday through Friday. Um, and although the program still requires a bit of a referral um, that um, we try to improve access by having it to be any kind of health or wellness provider. So it could be a, a mental health clinician in community or a community health nurse um, that can also refer into the program. Um, in addition, patients can also go through the First Nations Doctor of the Day program to, um, to get access um, to VSEPs. We can um, move the slide. Oh, and the programs are open to all BC First Nations and their families, including our urban and away from home population. So people who um, may be from elsewhere, but are residing in BC. So I just wanted to share a bit about my own vaccine story. Um, so um, at, at this time, I'm now fully vaccinated. I had my first um, injection of the Pfizer vaccine um, on January 1st, which felt like a really great way to um, start the new year. And in the two weeks before I got the vaccine, um, I had kind of a lot of anxiety uh, just around whether or not I was going to be eligible um, in the first round because I, I had resumed doing outreach to First Nations communities. Um, a lot of that anxiety came because I didn't I didn't want to be a vector. I didn't want to bring um, bring COVID into the communities, but also seeing not having that in-person connection was having, um, you know, um, its own adverse effect on on my patient's health, and so kind of balancing that. Um, and so um, 
with the inclusion of um, rural and remote Indigenous communities and the providers that serve them um, in the first round, I was eligible um, and had and got an appointment. Um, and once the appointment was made, um, you know, the anxiety, I was really excited, but there was also some anxiety because there's been, um, well, in general, so much anxiety around COVID, um, so much things on social media um, around COVID and the vaccines and and so, you know, there was, you know, some of that that came up in me too, being like, okay, so I'm going to go tomorrow to get this vaccine um, and really kind of like needing to navigate that. And so for me, um, it's really important that um, I, I connect and ground in certain ways. And I do that by smudging and prayer um, and um, meditation or being outside. And so using that time to kind of get quiet, to get by the water, um, and to, you know, um, you know, um, help me to um, get to a place where I, I was going into the vaccine with a good heart and a good mind, where um, I, I believed in the power of the medicine um, and felt like I was doing the best thing, not just for me and my family, but also for the communities that I serve. And so the next day, I went and got my vaccine, and um, and I honestly, right after I got the vaccine, I was just flooded with relief. I was, um, you know, I was tearful um, because it just felt like for, for the first time in like eight months, <laughs> uh, there was a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I could see that, um, you know, relief was coming and that we were going to be able to save, um, you know, our, our elders and our community members um, from further grief and loss. Um, and also um, hopefully be able to resume some of our, our, our services um, that have been um, lacking due to restrictions around COVID. Um, and then uh, I think just last Thursday, um, I got the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And um, I think lots of people have been talking about how when you get the second dose, you have a little bit more symptoms. And so after the first dose, I honestly, I, I was a little tired. And the next day, my arm was a bit sore, but I went skiing. And, you know, by the time I was done skiing, I, I didn't even notice. Um, the second time I got the vaccine, um, I again was mostly the first day I was just tired. And the second day, my arm was a bit sore and I had a little bit of muscle aches, um, but I took a little bit of ibuprofen. And by the time it wore off, um, my symptoms had resolved. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, um, my side effects were quite minimum. Uh, I was lucky that way. Um, and, you know, I just feel, um, yeah, I, I feel empowered. I feel, um, you know, hopeful um, that we're, you know, um, that, that we're turning a corner with this pandemic. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to share a bit of my own my own journey with you all, and just to encourage everyone. You know, if you're um, if you have questions about the COVID vaccine, please talk to a provider that you trust. Um, look for sources that you trust, um, and ask ask lots of questions, um, and make sure that you feel that you get to a point where you feel comfortable and confident. Um, and then also remember to to help prepare your heart and your mind to receive the medicine in, in a good way, just just like we would do with our traditional medicines. It's not Chalia. Thank you. And I'll pass it to Nell. Great. Thank you, Terry, for all of that. Um, and so if we can just move to the next slide. Uh, and I did just call, I did see the question in the chat, and I think Terry and I can try to answer that uh, in this part of the presentation as well. Uh, so I just wanted to give people um, a bit of an update on sort of where we are now. Terry presented some uh, data specific uh, to January, um, but in British Columbia, for example, as of two days ago when I did these slides, uh, on that particular day in the 24 hours preceding, BC as a province had had 449 new cases. I believe yesterday was up a little bit to something like 559 cases, I think it was provincially, uh, making for a total of around 77,000 cases, a bit more. And unfortunately, as um, we've mentioned, um, in provincially 1,335 deaths, which I think there may have been one or two more, I can't remember off the top of my head, sorry. In British Columbia, in among First Nations, we have had just under 5,000 cases total since the pandemic began. 
and around 80 deaths. And as I mentioned off the top of the presentation, you know, we feel uh, very much for communities who have lost um, uh, community members um, and our hearts go out to them. And uh, it obviously is one of the major inspirations for I think both of us and all of the people working on the public health response to COVID-19, including the vaccine rollout. Um, so these include um, cases uh, in community and away from home. Now, you may have heard a little bit in the news, I don't want to go into too much detail about variants um, of the virus, and they're called variants of concern or VOCs, uh, but there have been different variants <clears throat> already identified in the province of British Columbia. So for example, uh, B117 is the, the UK variant or United K Kingdom variant. Uh, B1351 is the South African variant. Uh, P1 is Brazil and B1525 or Nigeria. And those are the first four that I have heard of. Um, and in particular uh, in British Columbia, uh, we have somewhere around 80, probably a little bit more uh, cases of the variants identified to date. Um, in January, for example, British Columbia was only testing around 15% of the samples. So it's easy to understand that these numbers of variants may be an underestimate. Uh, but now uh, it was announced by um, Dr. Rekha Gust Gustafson, who was uh, covering for Dr. Bonnie Henry, that British Columbia is now testing about 70% of the samples. Um, and the reason why these are variants of concern are because there are issues around um, the variants, um, in some cases, having ease of transmission, meaning they're the spread, um, and perhaps being um, causing more severe um, courses of illness. And, and there may be, uh, these things are being researched all the time, which is why I'm sounding a little bit big um, around whether or not the uh, variants uh, have any uh, effect on the effectiveness of the vaccine. So there's a number of questions um, around these variants and why people in public health are keeping such a close eye on them. Uh, the picture to the right, I just wanted to make a note. Um, this was from the, the provincial survey that was uh, done actually last summer. So the numbers may have changed a little bit, but to just highlight for people that, you know, COVID-19 has been creating challenges uh, for uh, everyone in British Columbia, including BC First Nations on a number of different indicators. So for example, mental health, you know, we've, we've, all talked about and, and felt it ourselves, sort of the stress of living uh, in a pandemic where uh, at times it's felt very uncertain, very unpredictable, and we've had very uh, little control in some respects over you know, how this is going to go. Um, and the fact that the vaccines are actually, you know, as, as Terry, as Dr. Terry mentioned, you know, one glimmer of hope that, you know, there's going to be a way out of this, at least living under these uh, public health measures at some point in time, once we get uh, the majority of the population vaccinated. Uh, so next slide. S sorry, um, Dr. Wyman, I just wanted to jump in here uh, a little bit unsure of the language that's being used when you use the term variant what is that i guess what does that what does that mean um, oh sorry those are variants of the virus and specifically it has to do with um terry showed the picture with the little red spike proteins and so when there's a significant difference in sort of the shape of that protein that makes it a variant so it's like a mutation all viruses mutate um, but when they sort of differ in a significant way, then, then they become variants. And that's why they're concerning because, um, like I said, they, there's a potential of spreading more easily. Um, and so where, you know, you've heard probably people talk in the news over the last couple of weeks or so that, you know, we are kind of, not to sound alarmist, but, you know, in a race, in a way, uh, provincially, nationally, globally, to get enough people vaccinated before these variants can spread more widely. Okay, okay. great. So the, so the variant is, is so there's a virus and, and essentially they just a little bit different shape or something, but it's the same virus. They just attach differently or infect yes. differently or whatever. Yes, okay. so, all, so all viruses mutate. Um, that's the nature of viruses. But uh, in this case, you know, it 
people are keeping a close eye on how the virus mutates because, because of the potential implications for people's health, uh, what it might look like if they get sick with the virus, and then how we go ahead treating or addressing the virus and stopping the transmission through vaccines. Um, right. So if I just look at this slide, um, this is, if you go to the BC uh, provincial website, you will see uh, the same graphic. This is essentially um, British Columbia's COVID immunization plan of which First Nations uh, fit into this. And there have been some changes um, over the last couple of days, actually, some alterations. And I think here is what it would be a good point for me to step back and just say, you know, first of all, um, some of the other um, underlying principles of the vaccination distribution are, that people can keep in mind is, you know, this is a global pandemic of which none of us have seen. Uh, you know, it hasn't occurred at this level in a, about a hundred, hundred years. Um, and so it's a novel virus. It's new to all of us. And the situation changes quite rapidly. It's a very dynamic situation. And some days, you know, it almost seems like things change daily. So it's necessarily, um, it's going to happen that sometimes the, the plan for the vaccine rollout is going to change. And I can appreciate people's frustrations because as Terry mentioned, you know, we are all living through this pandemic ourselves, um, as including those of us who are working on the public health response. And there's a great deal of anticipation to, you know, when am I going to be able to get the virus? When is my community going to get the virus? When is, you know, all of these questions. And we try to give the best answers that we can, but at some times things change. For example, you know, there was a delay over the last month in both the distribution and allocation to Canada in general and the provinces of, of both the Pfizer um, and Moderna vaccines, which had a lot of implications for our vaccine rollout uh, to BC First Nations. So um, one of the things that's important to recognize as well is, you know, at FNHA, and at other First Nations tables, um, you know, the, at the regional level, the health authority level, the provincial level, people um, have been very strongly advocating for First Nations people and Indigenous people in the province to be considered one of the priority groups. There's a whole number of reasons why we advocated for that, partly because of our elders who are valuable cultural resources for us in terms of language, knowledge, ceremonies. And we want to ensure that as many elders as possible um, are protected by the vaccine. Uh, and given we have already, you know, we acknowledge that we have had losses of some elders uh, in communities. Um, and the other reason is, the other couple of reasons just quickly is, you know, we have you know, we know of uh, evidence, for example, of um, BC First Nations in this case, you know, who suffer higher rates of chronic diseases and yet at the same time have uh, poor access to health services. And many of many communities are uh, rural, remote, isolated. And so just, you know, without that virtual doctor of the day program that was stood up during the pandemic may not have had timely access to services. And, and I know from, you know, working in the response for the last year when communities have even a couple of cases, it really raises the anxiety level. And of course it would because people are worried about it spreading further and having a, a cluster or an outbreak and then have very little access to, you know, acute care. So this is the plan as in general, and we have already more or less in British Columbia passed through phase one. And these are the first two phases uh, will cover the higher risk populations. Um, so the first phase one was people um, living in long-term care, our seniors provincially and assisted living, including resident staff and one individual for each person who would be considered an essential visitor. 
um, and hospital workers who provide acute care to COVID-19 patients. So these would be physicians working in ICUs, um, internal medicine, inpatient units, emergency departments, and um, remote and isolated uh, First Nations communities. And so for the most part, that has proceeded on relatively on schedule. Phase two is um, it has been worked on, um, but there have been some delays, as I mentioned, because of the, the delay in the vaccines actually being shipped to Canada and to British Columbia. So we are still working on um, some of the populations identified in phase two, while at the same time getting larger shipments of the vaccine so that we can proceed into phase three um, in a relatively short period of time. So I, I won't go through this in detail. I will ask to go to the next slide. Um, so as far as the COVID-19 rollout uh, in British Columbia for First Nations, um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the most remote and isolated communities were identified in phase one. And the first doses actually arrived in December, around the end of December. And you'll see from the pictures here, just examples of the vaccine arriving. Um, you can imagine the logistics involved in, in shipping the vaccine to different places by float plane in some cases. Um, in the first month or so, one of our uh, senior executives who actually works in logistics was actually driving uh, you know, packages of the vaccine from community to community and got a speeding ticket, if you can believe it. Um, you'd think the police officer would have, you know, said, oh, you've got vaccines, let me help you by, you know, making, giving, leading you the way, but instead he gave him the ticket. Um, but so it's started to roll out over the last uh, six weeks or so. Um, and one of the things, again, that we have always been strongly advocating for at FNHA is what we call a whole of community approach. So this means instead of um, just uh, as the pr province in some ways has taken the approach of, you know, we're gonna start vaccinating 80 years and older and then 75 years to 79 years. We have tried to, for BC First Nations communities advocate in the most part for the whole community to be covered. So in the case of Pfizer, that might mean 16 and older in the case of Moderna, 18 and older. Um, there has also been um, uh, some uh, advocacy that takes place when there have been large clusters or outbreaks in communities. So uh, health, some of the regional health authorities have given uh, vaccines um, that we can use uh, to respond to outbreaks. An example of that has been the two relatively large outbreaks on Vancouver Island with the Sanema community and Cowichan tribes. Um, so as of, um, and I should say that, um, again, because of the limited supply at some, and in some cases we have had, had to make difficult choices and not be able to vaccine, uh, vaccinate the whole community, but we have been forced by the limited supply to say, start with 65 and older in a certain community and then make plans to go back and give the rest of the eligible community members and who wants to have the vaccine at a later date. Um, so almost, I think around 19,000 doses of vaccine have been delivered. The large majority of that are first doses, a smaller number second doses. Moderna has just arrived back in British Columbia. So uh, most of that allocation over the next weeks, two or three weeks, I think is going to go for second doses to, to make sure that the vaccination has been complete. Um, we have about 80, 80 communities that have received their dose one, 21 are in that partial situation um, in terms of um, being partially complete, having their dose two, and eight communities are still, uh, have just received their first, first dose. So again, as I mentioned, the plans have needed to be nimble, responding to challenges, um, et cetera. Um, the next slide. And I will try to speed it up. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share these slides in a PDF form too, if people want. Um, so I won't go through all the bullet points in general, but to say that, again, you know, this type of, of vaccine rollout um, provincially for 
First Nations and Indigenous populations um, is a massive undertaking. And it would not be possible without engaging with the communities themselves, the regional FNHA teams, the regional health authorities, provincial health authorities, and in some case, sharing information and best practices with federal government. So there's a lot of communication going back and forth. Um, and for communities especially, um, there has been resources developed uh, to help uh, support both in terms of just general preparedness for communicable diseases, but um, how to prepare for a vaccine clinic, ex uh, for example. Um, and uh, Terry has already mentioned the virtual, the virtual services that have been stood up during the pandemic to provide services. One of the things I saw in the chat that I'll just touch on briefly before I switch to the next slide is the difference between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And, and Terry spoke to the fact that these are mRNA vaccines, which use that, that sort of little recipe of mRNA to teach your cells how to recognize, teach your own cells how to recognize that spike protein and mount an immune response against it. Initially, Pfizer was saying, um, and most people have heard on the news, that it needed to be um, kept at ultra cold temperatures, like frozen at ultra cold temperatures, like minus 80 or something like that. And so what ended up happening initially when the vaccine distribution plans were being made was because of that necessity of keeping it at that super cold temperature, it could only be shipped and kept in certain places that had the proper freezer, freezers equipment to hold it there. And then that limited sort of how far away you could actually transport the vaccine and thaw it and, and deliver, administer it. Lately, I think it's been the last week or so, and Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Pfizer has actually said that um, essentially it does not need to be treated in that ultra cold fashion so that it can be frozen at the regular temperature um, and transported. Uh, it's still, there's still limitations on the amount of time you can thaw something and, and before you can administer and, and an open vial needs to be used. So now uh, the difference, I guess, logistically is that we could probably now use it in more places than we could looking back at late January where we were mainly confined to having Pfizer be stored in larger urban centers and only servicing the communities that were accessible within that sort of geography. Uh, next slide. And I'm almost finished the slides and I see there's lots of questions. So what I would really encourage, um, what I would really encourage people um, to do is to go to our fnha.ca website and go to the COVID-19 portal. There are so many resources available there. It can, be, uh, it can be a little overwhelming, but two specific resources and one that we continually update is a FAQ section called what you need to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. And even as recently as a couple of days ago, we added in a couple of new questions that people have. And I think I saw one in the chat. So if we go through those questions later, then it'll remind me to, to try to help answer that question. Um, and the other one is for a, a toolkit for communities who are preparing to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And here I'll just make a note that, you know, one of the big differences between, you know, just flying into communities, um, you know, giving the vaccine and leaving is, you know, the whole issue of cultural safety. Um, there's, you know, people have strong feelings uh, about vaccines in general in some cases. And as, as Indigenous and First Nations people, we definitely have a history with past uh, pandemics, with past courses of infectious disease. Um, you know, the, the, the racism that we experience in the healthcare system, et cetera. So the communities themselves have done um, an amazing job when they've been organizing their vaccination clinics to embed the, the, the rollout of vaccines um, in ceremony. And we've seen incredible pictures and videos get sent back to us of the vaccine arriving in community being greeted uh, with song and drumming and prayer and ceremony um, and the clinic starting, you know, not starting before a, cer a ceremony is held. 
um, and then thanking everybody at the end of the day. That's quite different, right, than what you might picture sort of in a just general kind of large urban setting. Um, and so that that is really important. Um, and as Terry mentioned in her particular, her personal story, that she herself, you know, did these tr some traditional ceremonial things to sort of make it seem seem right or okay to have had the vaccine and and want it to work as best as possible. Um, so some of those pictures and videos are available as well on our website. They're quite moving. Um, when you think about it and when you see them. Uh, some videos of our elders uh, getting vaccines. Um, and one of the first ones I think was, a, was an elder, uh, a woman from, I think it was, get again, I can't remember the community, but she, she was 94, I think. And she, you know, sat there and gave a video after getting her vaccine and kind of shook her finger and said, you know, you all need to get this vaccine and protect yourselves in the communities. And so, you know, it's really nice to see that people have been quite accepting of the vaccine. Uh, Cause as we said, this is one of the tools we have to fight this pandemic and what will get us out of these uh, public health measures that we're living under. Um, I think there's only a few more slides. Uh, next slide. The one reason why I wanted to put this slide in, and I don't want to overwhelm everybody with the bullet point, um, is to acknowledge the role of nurses in the vaccine rollout. Um, I think that's always important to acknowledge that, you know, this whole vaccine rollout would not happen without all of the different players. So people with public health expertise, that doesn't just include physicians, it includes nurses, it includes people who have you know, expertise in project management, uh, who are administrators. Um, everyone, I can honestly say, has worked so hard on this uh, distribution plan. And in fact, during the entire pandemic, um, it's hard to imagine what a life was actually like a year ago um, because we've all been working differently in some ways. And um, But I do want to acknowledge the nurses because in general, they're the ones who are distributing the vaccines and giving the vaccines to people. Physicians are participating in some cases, um, but nurses are really doing, uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And the other tool that we have in place that's still ongoing and that we're building up capacity in, in communities is community-based testing. Um, so that's just the other reason why this slide was here. And then I think I'm on to my last slide. If you can advance it. Yeah. So one other thing uh, that I'll talk about just before I end and, and open up for questions is FNHA has been working to build vaccine confidence. Uh, for all of the reasons that I have talked about uh, before, the historical reasons and, and some more contemporary reasons and what uh, Dr. Terry has talked about, um, you know, sort of uh, people having all kinds of, you know, questions and, and sort of second thoughts about the vaccine and what's some of the disinformation, misinformation that's available on social media. We thought it was really we thought it was really helpful to frame it in a positive way, and instead of talking about vaccine hesitancy, talk about building vaccine confidence. Um, and as Dr. Terry mentioned, you know the, the 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 regulation of these vaccines only happens when a vaccine is determined to be safe, effective, and of high quality, manufactured of high quality. So there's those insurances in place. But we started this campaign called Be a COVID-19 Vax Champ. And you can go to this part of our website and I think on our social media um, pages and put your picture up if you've had the vaccine and tell your story. Or if you're still waiting for a vaccine, uh, you know, just you can share your thoughts about, you know, when you might get it, et cetera. Um, so these are some of our uh, Indigenous physician medical officers at FNHA. Uh, Terry has been fully vaccinated, um, and I think Dr. Louie in the top right has as well, uh, because they are frontline workers and seeing patients. Uh, Dr. Shannon McDonald, who's FNHA's acting medical, or sorry, acting chief medical officer, and myself are still waiting for our vaccines, uh, but we can assure you that when our time comes to have the vaccine, that we'll be 
eagerly rolling up our sleeves and um, and willing to have that. So I think I'll stop there and turn to some of the questions. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks you. Thank you both very much for that. Uh, I really appreciate it. Just wanted to highlight a. Um, a comment that came in from Riley um, saying we are VIPs, vaccinated Indigenous people. That's a that's a fantastic <laughs> acronym. Thanks, Riley. I appreciate that. Um, so I just wanted to, to update everybody because we've had a few questions. All of the websites and the resources that were mentioned here will be posted on the website and you'll get an email for them. So there's no need to kind of try to frantically write anything down. It'll all be provided for you after the fact as well. Uh, so transitioning over to questions, I'm just going to throw them out generally and whichever one of you feels comfortable can just kind of jump in. We'll have a casual conversation about it. Um, so the first question is one of a more, uh, I guess, uh, emotional nature, which is how can I prepare my mom who has Alzheimer's and is a residential school survivor? And I think that that's a really important question to talk about. How can we prepare and support our elders and our family members to go through the process and to trust the vaccine and to, you know, to engage in that, given some of them may have, you know, really long term uh, traumatic histories, right? Yeah, I can um, jump in. So, you know, I think, um, in particular, I, you know, when we talk about, you know, the history around, um, you know, even in medicine, uh, where, you know, there were medical experiments done, um, where, you know, colonial institutions have, have caused a lot of um, trauma and um, negative health effects that, you know, in, in a lot of ways, we're, we're still experiencing, we're still living through. Um, you know, we, there isn't a lot of inherent trust um, in, in some of these um, you know, institutions um, and and sometimes in Western or colonial medicine as well. And so, I think acknowledging that um, that you know that that history is real um, and that you know that lack of trust is very understandable. Um, you know, is is an important part of this. Um, and so, I think one of the ways that we um, can, you know, so yeah, so I think. Um, one of the ways is just acknowledging that. Um, and then also looking at um, what some of our, um, you know, Indigenous organizations um, are doing um, across the country and in BC, including FNHA. Um, and, you know, I, I think part of having First Nations people, um, Indigenous people um, in the early stages of vaccine rollout in priority one and, and priority two, um, you know, has kind of raised some of that concern around, you know, well, why are we being chosen first? And and I and I think looking at um, the fact that COVID um, has had and um, is projected to have a, a you know a worse impact on Indigenous people because of the legacy of colonization and colonialism um, is is the reason, and it's been advocated for in Canada that because um, COVID can um, affect Indigenous people disproportionately, um, that we should be vaccinated earlier. Um, and and that has been something that's been advocated for by our um, um, by our our leadership, like people like Nell and Shannon McDonald with FNHA um, and other physician leadership. And it's not always, and it hasn't always, or um, Indigenous people haven't been given priority everywhere. And so I think it's actually a good thing um, so that we can, um, you know, help to save our elders and save more of our community members, you know, um, uh, from, from the COVID vaccine. And so, I think um, changing the lens on it and that, you know, Indigenous people aren't being experimented on. It's already, you know, it's it's done um, the necessary pre-clinical um, trials. It's been vetted through Health Canada um, and um, and vac Indigenous people are, are seen as priority, um, which um, which is just a different lens um, to, to look at it. And, you know, I think for, um, again, for me personally, um, you know, I, I want to, like, I, I wanted to get the vaccine um, so that I can continue to provide good care for, for my patients and that, um, you know, and as, as a role model that, you know, these vaccines are safe um, and that, you know, all the literature I've seen um, has, 
you know, has supported the fact that these vaccines are very safe um, and effective. Um, and whereas we, we know and we've seen the devastation that COVID has caused, you know, um, at this point, it's now even impacted did some of my extended family, um, you know, a cousin and um, an auntie who have passed away. And, you know, I think um, many of us are starting to feel it, it hit closer and closer to home. Um, and, and as Nell had said, um, these vaccines are, are a bit of a lifeline for that. Um, and I think for people with Alzheimer's, you know, it can be very challenging in particular, um, you know, depending on um, you know, the level of awareness and understanding. Um, and so I think, you know, as much as possible, trying to help them through that and help them through understanding um, and, and, you know, also um, being supportive and getting the vaccine as well um, can be really helpful. Right, okay, awesome, thank you. And uh, I'm sorry to hear the impacts you've been experiencing, Dr. Aldred, and I appreciate you sharing it with us here today. Dr. Wyman, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I'm just trying, I, one of the things I think uh, in the other questions, um, I hope that we touch on a little bit is, is the urban population. That was uh, one of the things I was thinking of because as Terry mentioned, you know, this has come up quite a bit um, in social media posts, for example, um, Dr. Evan Adams, who previously was our chief medical officer and has gone to work for the federal government. Um, I follow him on Facebook as do about 10,000 other people. Um, he has many Facebook friends. And so I kind of, uh, I, I can't remember what that word is called. I creep his Facebook uh, page and he posts a lot about the vaccines, uh, especially distribution in First Nations communities because he has that national lens now. And I go, I kind of glance through some of the comments and, you know, one of the most common comments is people, I think, being a little dismissive um, around, oh, you know, well, we're just being used as guinea pigs, um, referring to First Nations and Indigenous people. And I, I find that, first of all, I find that, you know, that's probably just a symptom of, of what people's distress is and, and how they're feeling. I try to be compassionate, but, you know, I have to say, you know, all of us who are working very hard on that, it gets a little, little tiny bit frustrating because, you know, in fact, the reason why we are included uh, in the priority groups is because we, you know, people have advocated, not just myself, many, many other people have advocated because of all the reasons Dr. Terry mentioned for us to be in those priority groups um, and including with the urban uh, away from home off reserve populations uh, where they will be starting, you know, at the older age groups for the general BC population of 80 and older, we will be starting at 65 and older. And, and that makes sense in certain ways because of the, you know, sort of the ravages of chronic medical conditions that when uh, we are asked to come up with, you know, the, the, the numbers of individuals who are 80 and older, the reality is, is we don't have that many people who are 80 and older because people die younger because of the burden of chronic disease. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, really sort of make that point that, you know, we are not um, being medically experimented on with this vaccine, that we are, in fact, finally being recognized um, as, a, a, you know, sort of a vulnerable population and, and bearing the disproportionate load in some ways of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this is an attempt at, at equity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Wyman, I appreciate that. And I, I do think that it's important to recognize the efforts of, of everybody that, that has been uh, doing all the advocacy and doing all of this work behind the scenes. We talked about nurses and, and you know, frontline workers like yourself, Dr. Aldred, and, you know, and, and the wonderful champions we have, you know, working through the public health policies like yourself, Dr. Wyman. So, it absolutely are. I, I feel like I speak for all of us when I say our hands go up to you and, and um, yeah, so thanks very much for bringing that piece up and I wanted to transition while it's kind of on topic um, and clarify. So are off reserve First Nation elders over 65 able to get vaccine in phase two or is it just strictly on reserve? 
Well, as I mentioned, there you know there have been some recent changes, even just the past three days. <clears throat> so because of the delays in the vaccinate the vaccine supply, there's kind of been an intermingling of phase two and phase three. So it's not as definitive as it appears in that uh, diagram. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, exam if if we put a strict age range on uh, First Nations groups or Indigenous groups. Um, and say 65 year old and over and elders, um, it's not necessarily for the, you know, the, the organizers of the rollout to determine who is and who isn't an elder. Um, you know, that comes from the community level. Each community recognizes who an elder is in their community. And that may be someone who's 60 years old. So we have been advocating for 65 years and older of of the First Nations or Indigenous populations and elders. So that would potentially include people who are younger, but who are recognized as elders by their communities. And the urban, I'm just looking at a comment right now uh, in the chat. Um, when we're talking about the urban rollout, that would include all three major Indigenous groups, First Nations Off Reserve, Métis and Inuit. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that. Um, so now we have a, a couple kind of questions that are more on the vaccine specifics. And I know that the science is changing all the time. So I thought we could walk through the questions, those that we can answer, fantastic. And those that, uh, you know, that need to be answered with science and time, then, then we'll do so. Um, the first one being from Linda. Um, Referring to a, a comment that was made earlier about vaccine and their need for um, really, really low temperatures when kind of uh, storing the vaccine. Is that why Moderna was delivered to more uh, to the most remote communities because of the travel temp temperatures that were thought to be needed at the time? Um, or is there a different reason why Moderna was used more specifically? Terry, I don't know if you have some extra information, but initially the decision around Pfizer versus Moderna was partly based on the logistics, like the need for storage, for ultra cold storage. Um, and uh, because Prince George actually had, the, had some capacity for ultra cold storage, that's why Pfizer actually got delivered to some of the uh, more remote communities in a way, which sort of intuitively doesn't make sense. But because Prince George had that ultra cold storage, that's why Pfizer was able to get there. And I wasn't sure whether I misinterpreted one of the questions in the chat, but I did see a question around Pfizer versus Moderna and what happens, uh, what has been happening with the rollout is, you know, as the, as we find out what our allocations are based on a number of factors, including geography, we will say, okay, well, we'll have say 200 Pfizer doses go over here or we will have 200 of Moderna go over here. So if you are uh, on, living in a community on reserve and, and people don't, individuals don't really have a choice to say, oh, hmm, I'll take the Pfizer vaccine versus Moderna. It's kind of, when it comes to a community, you will get what you get. And, and I don't mean that in a harsh way. Um, it's just the way that it's getting distributed. And same with the urban uh, pop with the urban clinics that will be happening at different facilities i think you know a certain vi a certain vaccine will get will get transported to a certain facility and that's the vaccine that you will get and as terry said the you know both of them have high effect you know efficacy so they're highly effective um even after the first dose yeah, there isn't any significant difference between the efficacy or the safety of either one of them. So it's really just the logistical concern is kind of what I'm hearing in terms of which yeah. you get. I can, um, yeah, and just to kind of, um, um, in addition, like uh, the Moderna and Pfizer, like obviously they were developed by those companies and there may be, uh, well, there may be, there, there's small differences in, in you know, what what the vaccine looks like, um, and um, however the um, the mechanism, so the mRNA vaccines are the same, so it's the same type of vaccine. Um, and as Nell said, that they're very highly effective. Their clinical trial phases look very similar. Um, the um, the side effects that I mentioned earlier are very similar. Um, 
And so like the effectiveness um, between the two uh, on initial rollout looked like 89 to 92% after the first vaccine, um, and then up to 98% after the, the second dose. Um, and now, even now there's um, some publications that saying like um, some of them are actually as a, uh, about 93 to 94% effective after the first dose. Um, and so, yeah, so they're, they're very, very similar and it's, um, and there isn't one that's better than the other. And there's going to um, likely be a couple more added um, to the, to um, what types of vaccines are available that will have, that are different type, meaning that they're not necessarily mRNA. Um, um, but yeah, will um, but are looking like they're quite effective. And I think the, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, in a, in a sense of a global pandemic, um, that's, you know, um, but we haven't had to deal with a hundred years, haven't had to deal with such a mass vaccine rollout um, and, and pretty much almost as long, um, you know, um, there's gonna be supply issues. Um, and so I, I would just encourage people rather than trying, um, you know, I think it's better to get the vaccine that's offered to you rather than waiting or holding out. Um, you know, as I said, like the safety precautions around these vaccines are all being taken no matter which type. Um, and they're all, you know, being vetted through the regular process with Health Canada. Um, and so I would encourage everyone that once you do have the opportunity to get a vaccine, um, that I would I would encourage you to get it, as opposed to necessarily, um, um, you know, waiting out or, or feeling like there's a hierarchy of vaccines. Right. Thank you. Yeah, very well said. Thanks, Dr. Aldred. Um, so we're going to pivot to another question here, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant, which is, um, so the question is, how long does protection from a COVID-19 vaccine last? And I think I, I want to harken it back to a comment that I believe that you made earlier, Dr. Wyman, about kind of this race that we're in to develop the vaccines and, and vaccinate a significant amount of the populations before the vaccine, you know, has a chance to spread and mutate and change in a way that makes that vaccine, uh, I believe it's ineffective, or it would be relatively ineffective. So I want to kind of bring up, you know, hearkening to other kind of ongoing and mutating diseases like a, a seasonal flu, for example. I'm not saying these two diseases are the same in, in terms of their severity or anything like that. It's not what I'm saying, but rather that, you know, in the flu, we vaccinate every year, right? And so that the, the, the previous season's flu vaccine that you had received would be ineffective against the new season of flu. Um, and from what I understand, based on the science here, what we're trying to do is vaccinate enough of the population, both, you know, in North America and then broadly speaking, you know, globally, so that the COVID-19 virus doesn't have um, as many individuals to, to infect and, and opportunities to mutate and change into something that's perhaps more transmissible um, or perhaps more kind of severe. So to get back at the question, how long will the vaccine last? I imagine that would, it's hard to determine at this point because the, uh, the disease itself could mutate um, at any point. But at this point, you know, the, it's been relatively effective against the variants, correct? Um, I can take an initial stab at that question and then Terry, maybe you can help me out. Uh, you know, so for, for what we know, um, as you mentioned, Cole, we, we're not sure exactly how long, uh, you know, the, the immune response that's triggered by, by receiving the vaccine, how long that will last, like how long the effectiveness of the vaccine, how long it will protect you. Um, you know, we don't think that it's a short period of time, but like some vaccines need to be given, like even... Uh, if you're traveling internationally and you get a vaccine for yellow fever, for example, that vaccine, I think, is only uh, they recommend getting one every 10 years or something like that. So um, we don't know exactly how long the COVID vaccine effectiveness will last, um, but we it is important, as Dr. Terry mentioned, for, you know, what we're really aiming for in some ways now uh, provincially, and that includes BC First Nations and Indigenous people, is to get as many people to have that first dose uh, as soon as possible. That's what we're aiming for. Um, when you have had COVID-19 illness yourself, you know, you do have some, you develop some antibodies and you have some natural immunity following the period of infection. We don't, again, we don't know exactly how long that lasts, but for example, an announcement just came from Northern Health Authority yesterday 
that is aligned with sort of what people have been talking about uh, most recently is that people who have had COVID-19 illness and recovered, that we are, uh, they're asking people to not get vaccinated for about three months. Um, so because they have that natural immunity, but the combination of your natural immunity plus a first dose will give very significant protection. But the three month period where we're kind of asking for that so that more people who have not had uh, the illness can get their first dose. So we're really trying to protect as many people as possible sort of as as we move through this um, and so you know you've heard in the news different other things uh, being talked about like extending the period of time between first and second dose um, things like that and it's because like you mentioned Cole this is you know COVID-19 illness is a very severe illness in some cases that has proven to be fatal um, so we want people um, obviously to be protected um, against that. And as Dr. Terry also mentioned earlier, when you have the vaccine, once you've had the vaccine, uh, the first dose, for example, it's very important to remember that you're not immediately protected as soon as you get the vaccine. Your body has to go to work and develop that immune response. So probably 10 to 14 days out from the first dose and then you would follow up, it, you would, according to the guidelines now, you would follow up at some point and have a second dose. Um, and because, you know, we're waiting for the whole province to get vaccinated, and that includes First Nations and Indigenous people, we will still have to, main, we'll, we will still have to keep all the public health measures in place until that time as as many people in British Columbia are vaccinated as want the vaccine. And uh, so that still means wearing your mask, you know, maintaining that physical distance, washing your hands frequently, um, not, you know, keeping your social circle very small. And right now we're under a public health order to uh, limit socializing to your immediate household. And that means people that you share a roof with. Um, and if people have been watching during this presentation, I'm a terrible face toucher. That's not something you should be doing either. <laughs> I'm really bad at that. I need one of those collars around me that will prevent me from doing that. So you will need to keep up those precautions even after you're vaccinated. Cause I have seen uh, some people talk about, you know, you know, yay, now I'm vaccinated so I can go out and have New Year's Eve. And that's not, that's not possible right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Alder, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Um, well, just to echo now, like, so don't don't look at the, you know, Super Bowl south of the border as an example of what should happen after you get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> the cognizant dissonance was real there. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I just to agree that, um, you know, I think it's really important that we, um, you know, to keep in mind that for vaccinated people, none of the public health measures have changed. Um, so if, if you travel out of country, you still need to quarantine, you still need to um, follow like regional travel restrictions, um, you know, all, all of that sort of thing, um, the physical distancing, the hand sanitizer, the masks, all of that, um, keeping to your um, household. I think, uh, yeah, it's just really important to do. Um, as we get more information, um, you know, that may change. Um, there's other countries that are, you know, um, you know, yeah, altering things slightly for vaccinated versus non-vaccinated people. Um, but it, it's more of a, a time will tell. Um, some of the preliminary data shows that um, for people who have been vaccinated, because I know there was a, I seen a question around, you know, if you've been vaccinated, can you still get sick and transmit? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think the um, theoret, like in, in theory, um, you could potentially still get COVID in your mouth and could potentially still um, transmit. And so that's why, um, you know, the public health measures are still um, in effect. Um, there is some a small amount of data coming out saying that it does seem that people who have been vaccinated are less likely to tr transmit, but they're unsure if that means you know, essentially what level that is. Um, and that's very early data. 
Um, and that, you know, um, for all vaccines, for whatever reason, there there's always um, a small number of people who um, just don't respond. So they just don't mount the same um, uh, uh, immune responses, say most people would. Um, and it, it's in the realm of around 5%. Um, and um, for any vaccine, we've never been able to predict with any reliability who will be a non-responder versus a responder. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the, there is people who could still um, tr um, contract and get COVID even after having the vaccine. Um, the data shows that even if that were to happen, that you don't tend to have as a severe infection as those who have not been vaccinated. Um, so yeah, even though that that's a possibility, we still strongly encourage people to get the vaccines because again, there's no way for us, for us to tell it just because you maybe didn't respond to a previous vaccine doesn't mean that you won't respond to the COVID vaccine. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thanks very much. Sorry, Dr. Wyman, do you wanna throw something in there? Yeah, Cole, I was just gonna say, I, I was sitting here listening to Dr. Terry and realizing that we hadn't really answered your actual question, like gotten to the point of it, which is, you know, at some point there has been discussion that uh, you know, COVID-19 as a virus may mutate to the point where it sort of becomes what we call endemic, meaning it's kind of there, that we will never completely eradicate it. And it may be that, you know, that we go every fall and get our COVID-19 vaccine and we get our flu vaccine. Um, it's really hard to know at this stage. Um, so there's, you know, there's no definitive answer that that, that will take, um, that that will happen. But um, you know, things change all the time. But as Terry said, I think the most important thing is for people to really, you know, make an informed choice about their health. But we encourage as many people when it is offered to you to, to get the vaccine. Um, I did see a quick question in the chat that I think we can cover quite quickly is, uh, I think it was, um, is there a way to test if you have had COVID-19 in the past, but were unaware of it at the time? Terry, this is probably something you hear a lot of in your practice um, as well. I've, I've, I've seen this a number of times, including uh, one of the people that I work with um, at IPAC. Uh, she went on a vacation in March last year, February last year, down to San Diego and Baja, California, and came home and, and um, was really sick for about a week uh, with a respiratory infection. Um, to the point where it was very difficult for her to even walk around and and uh, she was really sick for about five days and um, that's very unlike her she's quite an active uh, person and so she was asking the other day you know do you think I, I sort of I'll never know whether or not that was COVID or not because she didn't get tested at the time because it wasn't kind of widely talked about just at that moment in in history last year um, and so the answer to that question is it's really, you know, it's really difficult in many cases, if you have had kind of a uh, an illness with mainly respiratory systems is what people are thinking of in the past year or so, um, we can't necessarily do that testing for antibodies uh, if it was like a, a long months ago. Um, so in some cases, people will just have to resign themselves to thinking that, you know, oh, I was really sick at that period of time. Um, and it may or may not have been, I don't think we'll know. I think the take home point there is to whether or not that was uh, COVID-19, uh, we will still encourage you to keep up with the public health measures to protect yourself and your family. Um, because we don't necessarily know there have been cases of uh, repeat infection or transmission. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I wanted to highlight there as well is that given the, the length of time that we've been in this pandemic, it's, you know, totally possible for you to have an immune response for some period of the pandemic, but eventually for that to fade as well. So keeping up with those public health measures and getting vaccinated is, uh, is really important. Yeah. Dr. Alder, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think um, just building on what you just said is essentially that, you know, the, uh, some people may have seen advertisements um, that certain labs are offering like ant um, antibody tests to say like, and you have to pay for it, it's not covered by our provincial um, um, MSP plan. 
um, to see if you already have antibodies to COVID. Um, and, you know, the reason why it's not covered is because we really don't know what to make of that information. So we don't know if you if you have some antibodies, if that means that you're protected. Uh, we don't know when you would have got infected or when that's going to wear off. Um, and so um, it, it's also one of those things that just because you have antibodies doesn't mean you actually like have a robust immune system or that you've actually had it before. Um, so you think about things um, like, um, you know, the herpes simplex virus, for example, um, about 60 to 90% of people will have some sort of antibody against one of one of the herpes viruses. Um, and most of those people will never have had it or, um, you, you know, and we'll never have an, an, an outbreak of it. And so that's just one example to say that antibody tests um, are, can be challenging for a number of different reasons. And so that's why we're not really, um, you know, recommending them or um, for, for anything, because we essentially don't know what that will be. And it can give people a false sense of protection. Yeah, for sure. I think, um... All these last few questions that we've been able to, to get at is, is uh, kind of key in, in reinforcing for me at least why we chose the title of the session we did and that the vaccine is a tool. It's one of the tools in our toolkit to, to safeguard the safety and health of, of ourselves as well as our community and our loved ones, but it is only just one tool. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things out there. We need to be kind of doing all of everything that we can to, to make sure that, uh, that we all stay healthy happy and healthy. Um, so we have one other question that I think is important to get at, um, even though I'm not sure that we'll be able to answer it fully, but um, will the vaccine be effective against other variants? Um, and building off of the conversation or the discussion we had previously, um, from what I understand, the variants are, so you have the COVID, let's just say COVID-1 is a very simplified example, right? Uh, that COVID-19 vaccine will mutate into a bunch of different variants for different regions and different reasons. Um, so depending on the way that the vaccine works uh, in the way that it targets these, um, the, your, the, your immune system will target these, uh, these viruses, let's say in your body, um, that will kind of determine whether or not the vaccine is, is, is or, or is a way to determine whether or not the vaccine will be effective. Um, so I think from my understanding, we're not sure if it's gonna be effective against these variants or variants from other variants to come because we haven't seen the data to, data to test that and whether or not the, the virus would mutate. Is there, um, is that kind of sounding like the, the, right, uh, the right idea or am I off base there? So um, again, it's, it's all early data, um, but um, there, there is, um, <laughs> For this, I've seen some data around the South African and the um, uh, the UK variants that the um, having the vaccine does confer some protection against those variants. Um, but again, it's very early data, and we're we're unsure um, how much of a difference it um, it would be um, uh, regarding like how effective the vaccine is. So the numbers quoted earlier around the, you know, after your second dose, you're 98% effective. We're unsure if that would be lower for the variants. Um, and, and if so, how much lower, um, but the, it still seems like it does confer some protection. Um, but it, again, it'd be one of those things that, um, as we follow, um, the epidemiological, um, data as it comes out for, you know, um, We'll, we'll be able to make a stronger recommendations um, as we go forward. Um, Nell, do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, I don't have much to add to what you said in terms of kind of the numbers, but Cole, you just reminded me as we're getting to the end of our time, uh, what I was gonna say in relation uh, to the vaccine being a tool and us having other tools to um, uh, combat COVID-19, and that includes, as I, I had one in one of my slides on uh, testing and tracing is still another tool that we have. And the reason why I'm raising this is because, you know, there is a lot in some cases, uh, stigma about COVID-19. Um, and I know that people, uh, for example, you know, and it, it, it's connected to race, anti-Indigenous racism, where we've seen in the news cases where communities have declared clusters 
of COVID-19 in their communities. And then, you know, in the surrounding areas, uh, stores, for example, or restaurants have denied any community members access um, because of the outbreak. And so there's a lot of, you know, reluctance in some cases um, and stigmatization that happens. And so I would encourage people, what we are seeing is, you know, people, for example, who may be reluctant to come forward and be tested, even though they have clearly developed symptoms. Um, and, and, and it, you know, your infectious period, for example, is two days before you develop symptoms and then 10 days after that. And so when people feel like, oh, you know, I've actually got some of the symptoms, like say, for example, um, you know, they've lost their sense of smell or taste. They've got some respiratory symptoms. They may have some gastrointestinal symptoms. And, and, um, and then they're like, I'm, I'm kind of just going to pretend this isn't happening to me. I'm going to, I'm going to carry on and, you know, be with my family or whatever that, that, that is, uh, you know, not that helpful um, in terms of spread, you know, trying to reduce the spread of disease. So even though there is that's the potential for stigma, I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to get tested who develop symptoms and there's guidance that you can follow. Um, you know, you can call 811, for example, and get guidance if you're symptomatic. The other thing that we've heard, we've heard a little bit about um, is uh, contact tracing. Um, so that means, you know, if you are identified as a case, if you're lab test comes back positive, public health nurses or community health nurses will ask you, who have you been in close contact with? And that close contact means the two of you have been, uh, been, been you have been uh, less than six feet of each other for 15 minutes of total time. So in a workday, for example, if we were all together, Terry, Cole, and I were together in the studio and we were, we've were we just spent this hour and a half together, say huddled over a desk, we would be close contacts of each other. Um, and we've heard some people saying, you know, well, you know, I don't wanna look bad and say that I've actually been visiting with a few people and I, I don't wanna, you know, look bad because I went to work or whatever. I would just encourage people that the, you know, honesty is the best policy always. And uh, it's very important for us to, to both have people tested and contact tracing done so that we can stop the spread uh, before it, 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 it gets any further. Um, so I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks now. Um, and just to kind of build on what she's saying, it, it's kind of like, think about it like a harm reduction Component. Like, you know, we know the public health um, guidelines and, you know, s you know, sometimes you, you may step out of them um, occasionally, um, but it's really important um, to come back to trying to adhere to them as much as possible. Um, and if you had an exposure or if you are feeling respiratory, uh, like having respiratory symptoms, um, to remember um, that, you know, we're thinking about like, like our family and community good. Um, and so in order to reduce the harm of COVID, it's really important to be honest and to self isolate and follow um, the public health guidelines as, um, you know, as, as um, strongly as you can. Um, and I just wanted to take like 30 seconds, I know we're wrapping up to answer some of the questions that came in or just to re reiterate. And that would, is that, um, so the current recommendation is that if you've had COVID, you can still get the vaccine, but we're asking people to wait um, three months, um, or at least that's been the direction from some health authorities to wait at least three months so that we um, can vaccinate more people um, because um, it's felt like they'll have that kind of natural immunity for about three months, at least. Um, um, the other thing is just around, um, you know, once you are vaccinated, um, you know, there there is a theoretical risk that you could still pass on COVID. Um, and um, although, um, as I said, there looks like there's some preliminary evidence saying that it's reduced, um, it's likely not zero. And that's why even if you are vaccinated, you should still follow public health measures. So um, as a doctor who's going in and, and providing in-person care, um, it's really important that, um, you know, I still use PPE, I still have my mask, I wear gloves. If people are having respiratory symptoms, I gown up and wear 
you know, full PPE with face shields. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't changed, um, you know, my process um, since being vaccinated, meaning that I, I wear scrubs that go in the washing machine as soon as I get home and I shower and all of that before I, I, I greet my family. Um, so, um, yeah, it's really important, like I said, that just because you've been vaccinated, because we don't have enough data to keep following the public health guidelines um, and, and to do those things um, to ensure that um, we're keeping our loved ones safe. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we, we've reached the end of our time. Thank you very much, Dr. Elder, for quickly addressing those questions. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you both so, so much for being here with us today. Uh, Dr. Wyman, Dr. Aldred, we, your experience and your, your, um, your wisdom here is invaluable. Um, and thank you all so much um, that participated and threw in your questions and shared your anxieties and your thoughts with us today. Uh, I really appreciated being a part of this circle. Uh, briefly before we end, uh, we have more sessions coming up this week, a session on decolonizing sport as well as indigenous futurisms. And then the following week, we're gonna welcome Dr. Aldred back to the circle um, with uh, Dr. Ho and Dr. Liu to talk to us a little bit more about culturally safe care uh, in acute care settings. So, um, so that'll be a really uh, great session. We hope to, to see you there as well. Um, so yeah, if there's anything else that you'd like to, to leave us with um, doctors, uh, feel free, but um, yeah, that's all we have. I just, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for participating and for your great questions. And thanks to Cole for moderating, that was amazing. And Terry, I raise my hands to you for all the work that you're doing in communities as well. It was a pleasure to be here today, miigwech. Sorry. Um, yes, I, I just echo uh, Nell's sentiments. Thank you to you, Cole, to, to UBC Learning Center for inviting us and everybody for your great participation. And um, and really the hands go up to, you know, you, Dr. Wyman, and everything that the public health physicians um, are, are doing right now, because I know um, you're carrying a, an enormous load. So thank you so, so much. And it was an honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Take care.